I've promised our translator that I'll go slowly. But in fact, that was a, a, a small uh, misrepresentation because there are several things I'd like to talk about. But some of them you know quite well. So I'll reference them in passing so I can get to the more interesting part of the solution. Now, defense in depth is a key concept when we talk about security, organizational security. Because then, no matter how you define security, however broad the range, uh, if you in incrementally improve the security of every component that's part of your system, every resource you're trying to secure, if you raise them all a little bit, you have overall improved security posture. And then, as an organization, you can decide how to prioritize those resources, which things are worth more than others. This is a difficult discussion to have internally sometimes. Uh, because, for example, the loss of all your data doesn't seem like a very big problem until it happens. And then no amount of money, perhaps, can get it back. You may have seen recently some problems, the ransomware attacks against some American cities. Did you follow this case of the city of Atlanta where all the civil services were blocked because there was some ransomware that had attacked the offices and they refused to pay to get the key to unlock their own data? So in many cases, they had to resort to working with paper and pen. Uh, now, remember this one. We're talking about authentication. And this was a famous cartoon from the New Yorker that said on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Uh, we don't really have any mechanism to connect people to these online identities. I, I say that for a long time, access privileges were granted simply based on a user ID and a password, which in fact doesn't perform any real authentication in the way that we understand it. In the real world, in your community, people know you. They know you in your store, maybe in the bank, uh, or you have some documents that in person are acceptable. Your birth certificate, a driver's license, a passport. And these are issued by a local authority or a national authority. And then the purpose of apostilization is that so that amongst countries, we can have some confirmation that those documents were issued by an appropriate certificate authority, an issuing authority. So we have mechanisms for this in the real world that more or less work. Of course, there's still a problem with credential uh, fraud or loss of credentials. But for us, it's quite important. Online e-services, digital Kazakhstan initiatives would depend on citizens being are who they say they are. Uh, how do we know that a particular ID belongs to any particular person? How do we know that the right student is taking the online course or exam? Uh, how do I know who actually sat for that exam? Maybe it's IELTS or TOEFL or SAT exam. Uh, or in a, in a hospital setting, how do we make sure that we're connecting the right diagnostics and the right treatment to the right patient record and therefore to the right patient. In hospitals, there's an enormous problem over the years with applying the wrong treatment to the wrong patient with potentially fatal results. Ideally, digitization improves the outcomes here rather than makes them worse. So we need a reliable system to recognize who people are, right? Authentication in our case is the verifiable association of an identity with an individual. And we know that IDs and passwords are incomplete, relatively ineffective. And I told some stories about this a couple of months ago. Banks were pretty good at improving the situation. I say pretty good because some of them introduced additional, additional uh, mechanisms, one-time pins, maybe some recent history of your transactions, some personal history. Uh, it turns out with banking, 
it's very easy over time to establish normal behavior and abnormal behavior, anomalies. And a good system, we'll talk about this more later, will have some mechanism for detecting uh, anomalies. Things that occur that are outside the normal usage patterns or outside of what that person is supposed to be doing, outside of their roles or responsibilities. Uh, but of course, banks had an incentive to do this. Now the problem is, some banks don't do it just because of the expense uh, involved with the implementation. Now, the way to get around this is with multi-factor authentication. This is something that is now so prevalent that it's becoming standard. And it's remarkable to say that because it wasn't so long ago that a single factor was sufficient or uh, maybe an incomplete uh, dual factor. But let's think about this. Single factor for any one of them could be vulnerable. Multi-factor improves the reliability. But what does it mean to be multi-factor? Well, we'll give some examples. But typically, it means that it's something that you have, an ID card, something that you know, maybe the ID number or the uh, user ID or the password, and then something that you are physically that actually can't be changed. So this is where the biometrics come into play. And a little more carefully, right? Uh, a card. The main purpose of the card is to determine that you're really in the system, that you're a person who's been checked and that you have some role with certain responsibilities and certain privileges. And then it makes it easy to establish an account for you with a user ID and a password, maybe a personal identification number. And of course, at this point, there's a lot of history that can be used to help authenticate your account as needed at times. For example, where you lived or what accounts are active or what, I don't know, currencies you have or recent transactions, either location or amount or the date. But there's a lot of information that becomes relevant to your account that can be used that the organization would have that a casual user or criminal would not have. Now, the part of something that you are is now quite, uh, I would almost say, uh, common. And it's common because of your mobile phones. It's common because it became, there was a motivation. High numbers of these devices implemented with a need for security beyond a password. And it turns out the improvement of the sensors and the improvement of the memory and the computational power on your phone meant it became fairly trivial to implement biometrics. And now, Many of you have the potential on your own phones to use biometric authentication to, to unlock it so that no one else could use your device. And you could use uh, a fingerprint. By the way, how unique are fingerprints? Are they really good for authentication? It turns out, what do they say about fingerprints? Roughly one in a million, that, that's pretty good. But how many people are there? A lot. If Facebook has 2.2 billion users, it suggests that there might be a lot of users with actually more or less identical fingerprints, at least in terms of the number of data points that they're checking on the patterns of those fingerprints. So often when we talk about biometrics and we talk about new biometrics, they always say, oh, and it's better than fingerprints, more unique. But of course it would be because fingerprints aren't really that unique in the end. It could be facial recognition. And now this actually comes, I think the new iPhone claims that they can do facial recognition in like a millionth of a second or something crazy, that they can take the image and do the analytics. Uh, you, you can't blink your eye, right? I mean, it's faster than the blinking of the eye. They claim it's that fast to do the recognition. Or maybe retina scan, or maybe voice recognition, right? Or maybe in some instances, the gait tracking, that's the skeleton of a person moving. So in different circumstances, you might be able to use different biometrics to help with a multi-factor implementation. Now, two years ago, I gave a version of a talk like this, and this was still speculative, early stages, somewhat ineffective, often didn't work very well. The improvement in the performance of these biometric checks has been phenomenal such that they're now in these devices and could easily be used for 
more widespread authentication of users. Now, I mentioned this talk earlier because it's not just kind of what you do, but how you do it. And I loved this example, the keystroke dynamics, because it's not just what you type, but how you type it. And the fact that even if someone knows your passphrase or password, they can't type it in the same way. So you can do this for initial authentication, but you can do it, and this is why I bring it back, persistent authentication. So that I know, like, what if you log in and you walk away from your desk? Uh, somebody can check out your stuff. They can use your stuff. What if you don't want them using your stuff, accessing your files? If, if I sat down at her desk and started using her system, if they used persistent authentication using keystroke dynamics, the system would lock up because the way I'm typing isn't the same as hers, as the patterns that she's established. So I think that's kind of interesting. Now, you could do the same sort of thing with challenge and response, with facial recognition and all these others as well. But I like the idea of the keystroke dynamics because it's transparent and over time and very unobtrusive, by the way. And also, some of the early work on this was done by a colleague and uh, old friend of mine from New York University. So I'm giving him a, a little boost here. His paper on this was one of the most widely cited papers in the field when this came out. So this is what I wanted to get to. You might have seen this in the newspapers recently. It's getting a lot of coverage. I think it was in The Guardian yesterday. I think it, there's a Wired magazine article also yesterday out on this. But basically, there is a new standard called Web, web Authen, I don't know, uh, Web Authentication. This is the short version, which uh, implements multi-factor authentication across multiple channels, all three factors potentially, something you have, something you know, and something you are. And the nice thing is the credential is generated each time that you log in. So you enter in, let's say, your user ID. And then you have some mechanism for generating a login credential that's unique for that login. And even if it's compromised or lost, no one can use it to re-log back in because it's not a persistent credential. Like, when's the last time you changed your password? A week ago? A month ago? A year ago? Some people have never changed. In fact, some people cycle back and forth between the two passwords if they can. It's because it's hard to remember passwords. This gets away from that whole thing. And in fact, when I talked about phishing earlier, if you lose your credentials somehow, or you get phished, there's no point to it. Because even if you give up that credential, the credential can't be reused. So how does it work? Well, you could read all about it. I, I give you the link. But let me give you an example, kind of, that's been used for some time. An early example of somebody trying to replicate this approach. What makes this interesting is that it would be a standard that would be adopted across many platforms. So if the big guys, I don't know, Microsoft and Google implement this in their browsers and their systems, and if Amazon incorporates this, it means that you'd have an enormous installed base of people that if they adopt this uh, standard, you have almost immediate implementation of multi-factor authentication. And all the problems we've had the last 15 or 20 years, massive problems, suddenly kind of disappear. So I mention it today because for those of you who are thinking about digital Kazakhstan initiatives, where you're worried about how to connect the people, you might consider this as an implementation option uh, for, for the systems. Now, let me come to this one. Here's an early example. Something you have, a credit card. And something you know, the personal identification number. And then, suppose you make a transaction through an independent channel there's a confirmation message sent, say, to your phone. And you have to reply to that message for the transaction to be approved back at the vendor site in the store. So do you understand how this process would work? You go in. You want to buy some stuff. You give your card. And maybe you enter your PIN. And immediately, their system checks the back end. Their system sends you a text because they have your phone number on file. You reply, yeah, I agree to that purchase. And they confirm to the vendor, go for it. Approve the purchase. And it happens very quickly. Uh, 
Interesting. Now, this was done by a banking system, of course, because they were trying to address fraud. It was done actually in the Middle East, in the Gulf. And why was it done? To control household spending. In other words, let's say in this example, the, the father uh, has credit cards and he gives one to the wife and one to each of the kids. And sometimes the kids or the wife or somebody is spending excessively. Uh, they make the purchase, the, the, the message goes to the dad, the dad looks and says yes or no. It was strictly there to control household spending uh, in that environment. And it was remarkably effective. But one of the reasons it worked, it was relatively small populations. The first example I saw of this was in Qatar, and there were only one million people there, and not all of them using the system. So probably the number of active users could be in the small tens of thousands. That's, for a bank, pretty manageable. Maybe a bank in the United States with a much bigger user community, that might become more difficult to scale up. Okay. Uh, so apparently we fixed authentication. Notice I just breezed right by that, that the industry knows it's a problem. Many people are working, very big names, very big groups interested in fast authentication with uh, full reliability. I suspect that something I've been talking about really truly going back 15 years will now become a small footnote in my future presentations. And we'll be focusing on other security issues as the starting point. But I think for many of us, it's important because whether it's medical or driver's licenses or any of the others, you have to have some mechanism for that authentication. And I've, I've heard of many different examples, many different attempts to do so. But the next thing I want to talk about, which is really important, is this idea of access controls. I'm horrified when I come in to do security assessments and I find out that most organizations don't have really any access controls. I've been in organizations where the lowest level em employee has full system privileges to add users, to create users, to add records, to delete records, to change records. Holy moly, that shouldn't be true. Uh, without these controls, you have no mechanism really to maintain the integrity or the validity of your database or of the transactional history. If anyone could change the system, shoot, why not get in there and add more money to your bank account? Uh, you don't like the grade you got in that class? Change it. Or go to someone that could. Uh, so you don't want this kind of uh, universal access. Right? There's a reason that only a system administrator can create a new account or delete account. There's a reason that you've got database administrators who can create new tables or privileges for those who can read the data and then those who can modify the data. And you would keep, by the way, a transactional history of these things. We'll talk about that momentarily. So we can control the physical space, but we really need to understand how to control access to our system resources. And the way to do this is role-based access controls. Everybody in the organization has a job, a distinct role with distinct requirements. And you need resources to help you do that job. But you shouldn't have more than that. So there's a principle called least privilege. I give you what you need but no more. You shouldn't have more than you need to get the job done because otherwise somehow my access controls are ineffective. And as you do this, whenever that person's doing their job, there should be some log, a transaction log, of all the changes, let's say. Every user that was created, every um, transaction, every database change, every grade change in the university, there should be a transactional log so I can go back and see what happened, when it happened, who did it, uh, where, where they were when they did it, and so on. These transaction logs can become quite uh, significant, but they're super critical to understand what's happening in the system and later to determine 
what's normal and what's abnormal, and in the case of an incident, how we go back to determine what went wrong, how it happened, attribution of the event. So we have to monitor this usage, and this is important. Every time your role changes, you reset the privileges. So if you change the job, I deactivate your old privileges, and I reactivate a new set. This is huge. Now, why do I talk about this as the key accumulation issue? Well, in my previous position, I had certain authorities. Uh, I had access privileges. I'll call them keys because they were keys to various rooms, right? We all have them. And every time you change rooms, you end up with more keys and more keys, even though you might not need the old keys. This is common in organizations, that people end up, who've been there a while, having a great deal of access, which is not actually needed by the definition of their job, and probably unnecessary, and it represents a certain risk. Now, it might be convenient and useful and so on, but I should not have keys to my old office in New York. But I went back a couple months ago to visit those guys, and I went back to my old room, and I happened to bring my keys along, and they still worked. So to this day, I can access that building, go to the room, and use my keys. Well, that is not so good, right? Um, the same thing is true in our environments, right? In our online environments. These privileges need to be set and reset. And organizations often don't define these roles. They don't define the privileges. And they don't actually execute their own access protocols if they have them. I often ask for this when I go in to do a security assessment. Uh, tell me who has access to do this? Who has the authority to, to do that? How do you manage it? How do you control it? Is it part of your HR process? And rarely is this true. So how can, how can you maintain security if you don't understand what it is you're securing from whom or for whom? Now, oops. Now, I'll give you an example, quickly moving on in the interests of time, security policies. Most organizations don't have them in a way that is effective or implementable. They're often in a book that's about 10 centimeters thick that nobody reads. Nobody ever reads it. Uh, but, and they're not informed. So you begin at the beginning. You hire someone, and as part of their orientation, you make sure they know your security policies. Now, not memorized, but they have a framework for this. High level, clear, so they can take decisions. By the way, one of the biggest achievements of my career was that the high level policy document for my agency, my organization, was one page. One page. And then on that page, I made sure I had the framework, and then I referenced policies and procedures and practices. These were distinct. Distinct. Here's an example. Document control. Most organizations do not control their documents. You know, they print things, and then they recycle the paper. And you look on the back of the paper, and you see really sensitive information. Financial reports, uh, resumes, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, wow, that's not, that's not right. Um, so when you generate documents, how do you control the documents? So one of the first things you need to do, and now I'm talking hard copies, printouts, uh, let's say. So first and foremost, we can say, as an example of a high-level policy, documents are either public, controlled, or sensitive. And by default, every document is considered controlled unless it's otherwise explicitly changed. OK? A public document can be distributed freely without permission, and it can be stored, transmitted, and printed in clear text. No problem. A controlled document, internal distribution, external only with expri explicit, express permission, and, but maybe it can be stored, transmitted, and printed in clear text. But internally, probably I would say on, a, on a, an approved print station, if I were a little more thorough. Sensitive documents, no distribution, 
can only be printed on a secure print station. Hard copies must be stored, like typically under lock and key. And uh, digitals must be stored in and transmitted in encrypted form. So this is a very simple, simple example of document control. Now, most organizations would need something a little bit more granular, a little bit more detailed. But I discover in about four out of five organizations where I talk about the security policies, they don't even have a document control policy, even at this level. So if you say to your people, by default, all of our documents are controlled, what you say is uh, you can't distribute them outside without permission. That's a good starting point. And you have certain practices on how they're printed, how those documents are, are uh, managed, and how they're stored. So, of course, that's overly simplistic. But even that starting point is more than most organizations would have. Now, for policies, and of course, there's a range of them. We, we just looked at one. The effectiveness, clear, understandable, and a framework for decision making. I'm always amazed when I talk to people and they say, well, I couldn't do that because it wasn't in the book. Well, the book doesn't cover everything. Uh, and I know sometimes people are very nervous. If it's not written down in black and white, people often say, where is it written that this is the case, right? Either explicit approval or explicit prohibition. Uh, but I don't, I don't want that. I don't want people to only work by the book. I want them to have a certain degree of autonomy and a framework for making the decision, common sense. So if I have the high level and they understand our objectives, then at least when a new situation comes up, they're able to make a reasonably well-grounded decision that's consistent with our policy framework. And of course, when in doubt, they should check with a supervisor somewhere. But I like the idea that we're, we're enabling our people to make common sense decisions. And again, as part of security practices, you introduce them at orientation, you emphasize them in practice, and you have to enforce them. You have to enforce them. In my previous position as the deputy director of the National Cybersecurity Team, I enforce those rules. I enforce them. And I wasn't a bad guy, because I want people to like me, after all, and I don't want them to you know, not like me. So I, I did this in a reasonable way. So if I came by uh, your desk and you were away, and I found a, a document that was sensitive that was left, now I, I need to inform you. If I found something on a print station that shouldn't be there, I needed to take care of this. In fact, if you had several violations, you could be dismissed. You could, or, but it would start, of course, with a reprimand, with some rehabilitation training. Uh, Maybe occasionally you would lose some privileges. You would lose your right to work with sensitive information. So there could be some reductions of your role. But we had to reinforce these things. Now, we tried to do it in a positive way. I mentioned earlier, for example, the phishing example. I have my students prepare these exercises that try to get people to do the wrong thing. And when they do it, I don't fire them. I use it as a teaching moment so that the impact of what just happened is connected immediately to what they just did. And we would use uh, the social engineering techniques, for example. We would try to get people to compromise their principles or compromise their data in some way. And in so doing, we would be reinforcing our practices, reinforcing our, pol our policies. So that's something, again, that most organizations don't do. Or if they do do it, it's quite punitive, like very negative. The reinforcement should be, as much as is possible, uh, an improvement in the routine practices. Now, again, we talked about access-based, uh, sorry, role-based access protocols. We talked about security policies, both of which I claim most organizations don't have. But now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to formalize your internal security practices. And this is based on 20 years worth of work that comes out of Carnegie Mellon University originally on how to create and how to manage a, an internal uh, computer security incident response team. But it's not just about incident response. It's about security practices. This is very well established. 
all of the material that I talk about now, you can find uh, open access, public, effectively, from uh, a number of websites, uh, including the Carnegie Mellon CERT site. I think I have some of the references in the slides. Um, but it's really quite important. And I'll explain briefly the context. Most organizations don't do a good job of managing security. They don't do a good job of managing incidents. Often, they hide the incidents. But this is a terrible practice, because these should demonstrate a vulnerability in the system that can be fixed through a change in the configurations or the practices, maybe the policies. So it's very important that you capture this information and feed it back into the system. So what you need are professionals who are trained in this, whose job it is to help establish the policies, help implement the policies, and are there so that when things go wrong, they're trained in how to manage this, in what to do. For example, if you knew that you were going to lose your USB, your approach to it would be different. Number one, you probably wouldn't put sensitive information on there. Maybe that really embarrassing picture of you dancing at the wedding or performing. Uh, uh -huh, you, might, you might not. Or maybe you would encrypt it so that if it were lost, it would, you wouldn't be vulnerable. But for some reason, we're all very optimistic. And most of us, our USBs, are in plain text, not encrypted. And many of them have slightly compromising photos from that wedding last year. So uh, if you assumed from the start that you were going to lose this and that someone else would get that data, it would change your approach. So you can hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Laptops are lost or stolen, USBs, machines are compromised, software is no good, criminals look for easy targets, and so on. And some people give in to temptation. So knowing this, we approach life differently. I, I use lots of references to kids' movies because I have kids. Uh, but luck favors the prepared, right? You're better off when things go wrong if you expect that they might go wrong and you're ready for it. And lots of references. When bad things happen, who do you call? Often, you don't call the right person. You don't call your network system administrator. You don't call the help desk because you're embarrassed that whatever you just did broke the system and you'll be at fault. And maybe they'll blame you and maybe you get fired. So that's not good. So it turns out that usually when things go wrong, you don't call a professional. Now, in the case of an incident, I'm going to identify these stages. The first is incident detection. Now, I'm going to tell you right away that you all have different definitions of what an incident is, in the same way that we have different definitions of security. An incident could be different things in different organizations. And there could be different categories of incidents. And when things happen, uh, there have to be this, this idea of escalation thresholds. Some things are trivial. Some are more important. Some have a higher priority. Some get immediate attention. Some you better call the boss. Some you better call the chief. It goes like this. So your people need to know who to call and when to call them. And you need to know what's normal in your organization and what's not. I spend a lot of time on anomaly detection. And what's interesting about this, anomaly detection is simply big data. Big data of all the transactional records of someone in that job, that person in that job, doing that work over time. There are things that are normal for that person in that job over that time. Sometimes they do something that's not normal. And your system administrators should be notified yellow flag, caution, check this out. That guy is transferring huge chunks of data when his job often doesn't require that. It's an anomaly. So incident detection is kind of an important thing. Either people report it, or you notice that your system is behaving abnormally. So when it occurs, the reporting is important. Who do you call? That's why I have that. What's that symbol? It's from the movie Ghostbusters. So when you find a ghost, you have to call the Ghostbusters guy. It was their whole marketing scheme. So you needed to have somebody. So the way we used to do it is we would put stickers on the computers. And we'd have a symbol. You know, if something goes wrong, call 
the, the help desk or call the emergency response team so that detection and reporting could be done very quickly so that response can be done early. The earlier the intervention, the more effective the intervention and the less damage that may be done. Um, and then when you're doing your response, you have to worry a little bit about the investigation and the fact that as you respond to the incident, you can actually modify the state of the machines. And that would damage your investigation. So that if you really think it's something extreme and it might be criminal, then you need investigators, responders, to come in and use safe practices. We know how it works on TV and in the movies. The detective comes to a crime scene and they put the tape around and they put on the gloves and they very carefully start to you know, identify the evidence and you know, put it in the bag and seal the bag. We call it tag and bag, the evidence. Well, the investigators these days have to be trained in cyber forensics and forensically safe incident mitigation, incident response, so that by responding, you don't inadvertently damage the state of the machine. Because when it occurs, everything you do on that machine is changing the memory, changing the file structure. Uh, we, we, it might undermine our ability to collect uh, the cyber forensic data. So imaging the drives, imaging the machines, what's the state of the machine? You know, it was in the news last week. Donald Trump's lawyer, they, they, they went to his office and they seized all his documents, right? Do you think they cared about the documents? What did they really want? His digital data. And so what did they do? They took all the devices, all of them, all the, all the devices that have any digital capability. What was the first thing those investigators did when they grabbed those devices? They imaged each one of them and never touched them again. So they have, uh, any, any analysis they do is on a copy. And they can prove that the image they took corresponds to the state of the machine when they seized it. And they put it on a shelf for a while so that they could verifiably come back and show that this is true. So the, the approach to a cyber forensic investigation uh, means that your incident responders need to know how to recognize when this might be true and how to respond in a way that would preserve this digital evidentiary trail. Even if it doesn't require law enforcement, right? Uh, you still might want your internal guys to be able to do an analysis to figure out what went wrong. And then when you've done that and you very openly figure out, usually it's several things that happened that led to that event, you can then figure out how to change your policies, your practices, your procedures, uh, the settings of the machines, the privileges of the people, and so on. So this is quite important so that for each incident, you have this reflective process that improves the resiliency of your system. Remember what I said earlier, defense in depth, incremental improvement. Each time something goes wrong, obviously your current configuration had some flaw, some vulnerability. So we try to close that hole. So that the more these things happen, the stronger your organization gets. This is, this is quite important. That's why I said earlier that if you call the wrong person, oh dear, if you call the wrong people and you don't retain that experience, then you're doomed because you're still vulnerable. You're damaged and you're still vulnerable. We don't want that. So how do we do this formally? In real life, when there's a fire, you have professional firefighters. But when there's no fire, what do the firefighters do? They do fire prevention awareness. They do awareness and education. So there's a range of roles. They're proactive. You're reactive if you're fighting the fire. But by the time you have a fire, damage, already big damage. But if you've got those professionals and they know about this stuff, they go out and they improve the security practices. So we have the same idea. And in the last few minutes that I have, I'm going to talk about this. Oh, dear. I'm very close to my ending point. CERT, Computer Emergency Response Team. The first one was at Carnegie Mellon. They're the granddaddy of them all. And there are now thousands of these based on this model. 
and assert as an organization or an internal capability that provides services and support to a particular group of people for preventing, handling, and responding to these incidents. Now, there's lots of words. CERT, C-CERT, CERT, they're all variations of the same idea. Computer Emergency Response Team, Computer Security Incident Response Team, but what it does, part of risk management. It helps you implement high-level policies. It helps us respond to incidents and capture the lessons learned. It improves our robustness and our resiliency. And for many organizations, you have certain standards you must observe. So that having this team helps demonstrate that you comply with the standards for your industry, healthcare, finance, and so on. So we call, I call it kind of a Ghostbusters for cyber incidents. Now, so many things that you could do in one of these organizations. On the left, reactive. Alerts, incident response, incident handling, vulnerability handling. There's tons of these things. Any given CERT would implement a subset of these because no one could probably do them all. So any organization that wants to create a formalized incident response capability would choose the ones that they need. On the left, reactive. In the middle, proactive. And then on the right, this higher level uh, quality management. So certification, validation, education, and so on. Risk analysis, business continuity. Some companies, some industries must demonstrate their resilience in the midst of a crisis. A natural disaster, uh, you know, what's your disaster recovery plan? So this kind of thing might be necessary as part of that plan. Whoops. There are many levels. You could have an organizational one, like within a bank or within a university, which provides frontline support for that constituency. You could have one for a group, like the banking sector, the energy sector, the healthcare sector, so that each of those entities has their own internal group, but there's a backstopping group for that sector that knows about those standards, those practices, their risks, the kinds of systems that they implement that they would have in common. And they would monitor the risks for that sector so that when new threats emerge, they can proactively send out alerts to their constituents. So this mechanism of formalizing security practices and formalizing incident response is hugely important. And you could have more, right? Um, even national certs, national C certs. You have one here, the KZ cert. Every country should have a national level so that all the internal agencies can contact that national team. Those national teams are in contact with other national teams so that if we have something happening here, it's coming from Spain. We can reach up to the KZ CERT. The KZ CERT contacts the Spanish National CERT, and they reach down in their community to help intervene. This mechanism works. It works really well in practice because all of the key players have established relationships. You know who to call in your organization, your help desk. They have a C CERT capability. If they need help, they contact your sector C CERT, or they reach up to the national CSERT. And this chain can happen in minutes, this communication. Each of them has a way to communicate encrypted files with exchanged keys in advance so that if you need to send a log file up from your organization to the sector, from the sector to the national team, bam, you can do it in minutes because you know these guys and they know you. So establishing this infrastructure yields this kind of situation, and I'm almost done. Those green boxes are end users. This is your help desk. They're the first responder. They do all these things, alerts, updates, patches, policy enforcement, incident reports, incident response, and so on. They're the front line. That's inside your organization. The central C-CERT, maybe here, this is a bank coordination center. And all of those on the edge are bank internal uh, C certs. And they help establish higher level security for that sector. And they might provide, as a coordinating center, they might help provide deeper technical support for incident reporting, incident investigation, cyber forensics, etc., and industry specific awareness 
and training. The network could be a bunch of organizational C-certs, a central C-cert, this black box, it doesn't show, but law enforcement, so that you have established connections when you need to engage with these guys. These models scale well. The reason I'm showing them as graphs is that if you were to draw it a little bit uh, larger, you've got a mechanism for incident detection and reporting and response that can escalate very quickly from an organizational level to a national level. Suppose you're in uh, an ener the energy sector. Something happens to your devices. You might need to raise that incident report and issue an alert to others in your sector so that they're aware of what happened and perhaps how to harden their systems to prevent the same damage occurring to them. This kind of propagation can occur very quickly if you have this system fully, maturely implemented. Now, I guess the last thing I'll say is that for this to work, security means many things to many different people. Different organizations have different priorities. We want defense in depth. The way that we can help implement this is to make sure that we have kind of a checklist of what we think is important for ourselves. So authentication, policies, access controls, this idea of understanding what's normal and what's abnormal, the ability to detect, respond, and recover from incidents. But the thing I would emphasize the most is continuous quality enhancement, ongoing. Each incident is an opportunity to improve your resilience. So that last one is something that often organizations say they don't have time to do, that we don't have the ability to, to uh, be proactive on this. We're too busy doing our regular jobs. Well, I would say this has to be built into the system at every level. And if you do it at each level, it's incrementally a small amount of work, and often it's less work. It gives people good guidance, and there are fewer variations from your own policies and practices. I'll pause here. Guys, uh, security is a big issue. We have entire courses devoted to this. It integrates across our entire curriculum. I hope I've given you a feel for what's at stake, and I highly encourage you to investigate this idea of institutional uh, incident recovery, the CERT model to help implement your security policies and practices, because this is a well-known, well-established phenomenon that we know works, and there's a tremendous amount of material that you could download, open source, and use freely in your own organizations to raise your own uh, security profile. For today, thank you very much. That's it.